Or welcome everyone. Welcome to Office Hours with Michael Kitsis. So for the topic today, I, I want to talk a little about reverse churning. So almost anybody in the advisory business is familiar with churning. So churning is the thing where a broker would encourage an unusually high volume of transactions for a client, each of which generates a commission and kind of rack up the commissions and the income. So I, like basically churning is excessive trading. If there's not actually a good reason to do the trades in the first place, it was just done to generate brokerage commissions. And, and unfortunately, we still see from time to time uh, complaints come through on VINRA or uh, arbitration settlements that get announced of some broker that did a terrible churning thing and chewed up a whole bunch of dollars racking up transaction costs. Now, historically, churning really has occurred in lots of different contexts. Uh, you know, FINRA focuses on in brokerage accounts where basically you churn stocks and would earn stock commissions, but you know, churning investments of any sort is still a problem. So it could be Asia mutual funds, it could be annuities, it could be churning insurance products, like basically anything that generates an upfront commission creates some kind of incentive to drive churning activity. But the interesting shift that we've had over the past couple of years is regulators starting to ask questions about what they're calling reverse churning. So if churning is generating too many transactions in an account just to generate commissions, reverse churning occurs when the advisor puts the investor into an advisory account, like a fee-based wrap account, charges a management fee, but then doesn't actually do anything to earn the ongoing fee. All right? So if churning is lots of transactions to generate income, reverse churning is charging an ongoing management fee like you're going to do management transactions and then not actually doing any and just sitting on the account, earning the fees, not doing anything, not calling the clients, basically, as far as radio is concerned, not earning your fee. Now, you know, historically, we really didn't see reverse churning. We saw churning because most registered reps with broker dealers were compensated for trades and transactions. And so churning was the thing. And it's really only been the past 15 years or so that we've seen the rise of fee-based accounts. It started with an exemption that the SEC gave broker-dealers back in the late 1990s to allow them to do fee-based wrap accounts. Uh, that was popularly called the Merrill Lynch exemption because they could charge fee-based wrap accounts but not be RIAs. Eventually, the FPA fought that, got it struck down, uh, and we had kind of the explosion of hybrid advisors that are now doing brokerage accounts and fee-based wrap accounts or advisory accounts under usually corporate RAs as a duly registered advisor. Now, the good news, frankly, is wrap accounts really do seem to be cutting down on churning. And frankly, the, one of the primary justifications that the SEC gave all the way back when this exemption first came into place was they were trying to cut down the incentives for churning, right? Because if you've got a fee-based wrap account where the person just gets the same compensation no matter how many trades go off, there's no longer an incentive to rapidly trade and churn the account and grind the money out of the client. You just get paid an ongoing management fee and the client basically gets a, you know, a levelized trading fee, which is sort of the origin of what the wrap fee was. But now that we've had fee-based accounts going for a number of years, regulators are starting to get concerned that there's a subset of advisors out there who are gathering assets into fee-based wrap accounts and then basically not doing anything, never calling the client, never engaging any trades, never doing something to validate the ongoing management fee they're earning. They're just gathering up lots of assets, then moving on to the next client and just taking this ever larger, ever growing volume of management fees without doing any management. So that's this thing now that's getting dubbed reverse churning. So we're seeing SEC ask questions about this. We're seeing FINRA ask questions about this. And I think it's about to become an even bigger deal because the DOL fiduciary rule also raises questions about reverse churning. And in the preamble for DOL's fiduciary rule, they specifically noted that advisors charging ongoing management fees better be able to do something to document and substantiate that they're earning their ongoing fee. That they didn't just put someone into an advisory account, collect a management fee, uh, or I should say put someone into an advisory account in an IRA, collect an ongoing management fee, and then not actually do any management. And, and DOL is actually putting so much scrutiny on this that even the recommendation for a client to switch from a brokerage account to an advisory account, so from paying you know per transaction commissions to paying AUM fees, that switch will actually be a fiduciary recommendation for a retirement investor such that you not only have to validate what you invest them in in the advisory account, you actually have to validate the switch to the account. 
So here's the problem that crops up with reverse churning. I like I should say out of the gate. I mean, I'm 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 supportive of the concept of this. I'm not a fan of folks that go out there and gather lots of investments and charge advisory fees and do nothing for their clients on an ongoing basis. But here's the problem. I think a lot of us sort of intuitively know when we're good experienced advisors, sometimes the best thing the client can do is nothing. Sometimes the best thing the client can do is nothing, right? That's the whole focus of what a lot of us have about closing the client behavior gap. Hey, the market's crashing. What should you do? The answer, nothing. Sit tight. Don't trade. Don't day trade in a bear market. Don't go to cash. Just hang tight. Hold on your investments. Give them a chance to recover. The problem now is regulators kind of say, well, like, was that a good recommendation or is that reverse churning? Because you told the client to do nothing. Right. There's no there's really no clear delineator about where reverse churning begins and just prudent passive investing ends. I mean, there's almost something implicit in having a label like reverse churning that it suggests that the natural role of advisors is to always be doing something to validate our fee when the whole rise of passive strategic investing is suggesting maybe the best something to do is nothing. And and that just, to me, this creates a strange issue trying to reconcile being a good advisor, particularly one that happens to extol passive strategic investing and not getting whacked with a reverse churning claim a couple of years down the road if this gets to be bigger and bigger, which I think it's going to be. And you know, I don't know if this necessarily is just a function of kind of the do something of trading, right? Like we, I, I mean, the problem is it's not clear what what has to be done to not be reverse churning. Is it just? Uh, active managers should charge more than passive managers and as long as your management fee is low enough it won't be reverse churning that's an okay fee for doing passive strategic all right maybe maybe that will be a legitimate out but of course we don't know where that line is maybe some number of trades is still okay even if it's just very low maybe you just have to regularly communicate with the client to validate that you're doing something. Your do something is tell them to do nothing. But if you can show that you're regularly communicating with the client to tell them to do nothing, maybe that's okay. But it's not clear. I I, I think this is a real challenge. It's going to get messy in the past next couple of years because of this huge shift towards fee-based accounts and advisory accounts that the DOL has kind of nudged everyone that direction. And I think it's a good switch because churning, frankly, seems to have done worse things to people than reverse churning. But it's now going to get very fuzzy about how you validate when you're not reverse churning and you're just helping clients stay the course and manage their behavior gap. And then, of course, it gets even messier if you're not just an investment advisor, you're a holistic financial planner, right? For all of us that bundle together financial planning services with investment services, where maybe a significant portion of our AUM fee is for the non-investment portion of our services. Now, I, I know there's a whole discussion out there about whether AUM fees are the wrong pricing for financial planning, whether clients are being overcharged. Like, just assume for a moment, work with me, assume for a moment that the fee is fair, that we're charging a client a reasonable fee for the financial planning and the investment management. The question still arises, if it's a passive investment strategy plus ongoing financial planning for a single AUM fee, how does an investment regulator like the SEC or DOL properly vet whether someone is doing good real financial planning to validate this AUM fee and not constitute reverse churning? Because unfortunately, these are regulators that don't have any real purview over financial planning, particularly the non-investment portion of financial planning. I'm just I'm not sure they have the right tools to evaluate and vet that. We don't exactly have a lot of standards around everything from process and due diligence to competency for financial planning. So I I just I view this as a, a an issue to rise going forward. There 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 will be. Rising regulatory pressure on reverse churning. Like I, I will, you know, put a stake in the ground and bet on this. It's, it's just going to be the natural outgrowth of what DOL fiduciary has set in motion, which is not only this huge nudge of 
advisors to move towards levelized compensation, which basically means AUM fees and fee-based wrap accounts of various types. But because the switch from brokerage account to advisory account will itself be a fiduciary regulation, I think what you're actually going to see is in the roughly, what is it, eight months between now and when the rules take effect next April, there's going to be a huge pressure between now and then for broker dealers to actually swap people into fee-based advisory accounts. Because if you do it before next April, you just have to justify it under the existing FINRA rules. If you do it after next April, you have to justify it as a fiduciary change. So frankly, I think we're going to see a huge switch in mass over to advisory accounts under a lot of broker dealers before the fiduciary rule gets here. But then once we're there under the fiduciary rule, there's scrutiny for fee-based advisory accounts. There's scrutiny around reverse churning, whether you're validating the fee. There's scrutiny on switching to advisory. And again, not that I think it's bad for us to ask good, hard questions about what is an advisor to do to earn their ongoing fee. But it's a really awkward challenge when you combine that with the growth of passive investing in ETFs and the idea that increasingly the view of a lot of advisors is the right thing to do is to do nothing. Be passive, be strategic, keep your costs low, regularly rebalance, maybe do some tax loss harvesting. We're going to add some other value outside the portfolio in the financial planning realm. This is not compatible with the existing landscape of reverse churning regulations. Maybe we can get there, but it's going to be messy in the meantime. So I think if there's one thing that you take away from this listening to it now, it's if you are an advisor that has more of a passive strategic approach, I'm, I'm going to warn you now, start documenting what you do for clients on an ongoing basis. You're going to want this documentation at some point down the road. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, but the point is that you're going to need to be able to validate that you're doing something or that the appropriate doing something is to do nothing, but that you can show you're still regularly meeting with clients, communicating with clients, or doing something to validate your ongoing fee beyond just putting them into a passive portfolio and then never doing anything, never contacting them, never communicating them. You're going to want these notes in the file, in your CRM, to validate what you're doing as an advisor. But it really is a bit of a double-edged sword. Real reverse churning is bad for investors, but a lot of prudent passive investing involves doing nothing, and it's not entirely clear how to separate the two. So expect this to be an ongoing regulatory issue. I I think we're going to see a lot more about it in the next couple of years, both from DOL and from the SEC and FINRA. So I hope this has been helpful as some food for thought around kind of this new weird rise of reverse churning, the whole concept of doing something bad by not trading clients enough. But this is the wacky world in which we live as advisors. So thanks for joining and hanging out. Office Hours with Michael Kitsis, 1 p.m. East Coast time on Tuesdays. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.